Beverly Beavers has been telling this story for over 25 years, multiple times a year, and especially at our Victorian Festival. We are honored to have Beverly assume the mantle of Lady Vesti and tell her remarkable story from her eyes. Beverly's family is a second generation of Superior and therefore represents this community in multiple ways. I'll let her tell the story of Lady Evelyn Broadstone Vesti. I was born in 1875 in Monroe, Wisconsin. My name was Eveline Broadstone. The same year I was born, Papa found out that he had consumption. Consumption was not something that they could cure, but they recommended that you move to a hot, dry climate. Papa heard about a new little town just being started down on the Republican River called Superior. So he rode the train as far as Edgar. That was all the farther the train would go, and he had to walk the rest of the way. Luckily, Mr. Loudon, who was the founder of Superior, was trying to sell lots here, and so he was very welcoming, and he showed Papa around. One of the things that really impressed Papa was that all the wealthy farmers were down in Kansas, and the nearest rail line was Edgar, and so they needed a way to get across the Republican River. And so the businessman in Superior went out and built a bridge. So the farmers would cross the bridge with their turkeys and their hogs, and their other animals and would go to the rail line in Edgar and then they would have money to spend on their way home. Papa thought that was pretty impressive and so in 1878 Mama and Papa, my brother Louis and I, all moved to Superior. There were only about 150 people living here at the time. We bought a farm on the north edge of town and Papa bought a, a lot on Main Street to build a business. They asked Papa to be one of the members of the First Village Board, and he was very excited about that. Unfortunately, Papa's health did not get better, and in 1881 he died, and left Mama to raise us two small children by herself. Mama was Norwegian, and she was very thrifty and very good with money, so she rented out the farm and rented out the business, and we were able to have all the things we needed. We didn't have all the things we wanted, but we had everything we needed. I would ride my horse to school from the farm down to the school, which was about a mile away. I also became friends with Willa Cather, who was from Red Cloud, and we would ride the train back and forth, and one time I rode my bicycle. It was a long route, but I had a good time, and people were very nice along the way would give me water to drink if I needed it. I also um, decided that I wanted to help Mama. And so in the summer when the other students were out playing on the lake that was north of town or on the mill race, swimming and boating, I continued to study. So I was able to graduate from Superior High School when I was only 14. I was the youngest one to ever graduate from Superior. Uh, our graduation ceremony was in the Briggs Opera House. There were only eight in my graduating class and I was not the valedictorian, but I was the youngest. After that, I went to Iowa to a business college for a couple years and then came back to Superior to work. I worked for the Henningsen Produce Company and for the Guthrie Brothers. I just knew there was something out there I was supposed to do, something I was supposed to go to. And so the Briggs family, who were from Superior, had moved to Chicago. And Mama said if they would let me stay with them, she would let me go to Chicago. And so I did. I traveled by train to Chicago and stayed at the Briggs, with the Briggs family. I went to look for work and there was an advertisement for the Vesti Cold Storage Company. Uh, they were looking for a secretary. And I went and applied for the job and they said, well, you're really young and you don't have a lot of experience. So we'll let you work for two weeks and at the end of that time we'll tell you whether you had the job or not. And I said, you know what, I don't have that much time. I'll work till noon. You should be able to tell by then whether I'm going to work well or not. And so at noon, they told me I had the job, and I started working for the Vesti Cold Storage. I'd worked there a while, and one day Mr. Vesti called for his personal secretary to come in and take dictation. But she had gone out for lunch, and so I went in to see if I could help him. And he must have liked something that I did, because he asked for me to become his personal secretary. My salary started out at $12 a week which was the most money I had ever made. So much money that I sent half of it home to Mama every week. But when I became the personal secretary, my salary went to $20 a week. And I went out and bought my first store-bought dress. So they quit calling me that country girl from Nebraska. I started doing the secretarial jobs, and one of the jobs was to take minutes at their board meetings. 
And so I was sitting there taking minutes, and after a while, I figured out that I could make some suggestions that would make the company better. So one day I did, and they looked at me like, you're the secretary, you're not supposed to be giving ideas. But after a while, they figured out that I had really good ideas, and they asked me to become a member of the board. And so I became a member of the board, and then they decided to move the company headquarters back to England, and they asked me if I would be in charge of the Chicago plant. I want to tell you a little bit about the Vesties. Samuel Vesty owned a butcher shop in England and the Industrial Revolution was going on and they needed another source of meat to feed all the people. So he sent his son William to the United States to find the other source of meat. And he went to Chicago and what he found was that the people in the United States only liked the choice cuts of meat, like the steak and the roast. And they were just throwing away the seconds, like the heart, the kidneys, the liver. He was able to purchase those very inexpensively, ground it together, canned it with special seasoning, shipped it back to England, and it was very successful. By the time I started working for the company, William had already gone back to, to England, and his brother Edmund was in charge of the plant. So they asked me to come to England, and I just came home to ask Mama what I should do, and she said she'd come with me. So that was really good. I decided to go to England, and so I did. Working for the Vesties was quite an adventure. One time I had to go into Russia. Our plant in Riga was having trouble, but there was a revolution going on, and so I wasn't able to get there for a while. Finally, we got on a train. Another gentleman from the company went with me, and at every stop once we got to Russia, the guards would get on, and they'd go through all of our items, and um, would get us off the train, and make sure we didn't have anything we weren't supposed to have. So we finally got to Riga and I was so far behind, I said, just go ahead and take my luggage to the hotel, I'm going to go to work. So I went to work and it wasn't long, they came in, they said, you won't believe what happened. And I said, what? And they said, well, they just blew up your hotel <laughs> and you've lost all your possessions, but it was one time that it paid to go to work because I was safe and I made it back home safely. On another one of my trips, there was a gentleman there who was a German and he was always very friendly to me and very nice. And when I got ready to leave, he handed me a letter. And when I got back to England, I found someone that could read German, and he asked me to marry him. <laughs> and we'd never even spoken a word, so uh, it was kind of an interesting proposal, but I had them write a reply for me and gently said, no thanks, but thanks for the offer, and sent that back to him. I had a boyfriend, his name was Bernard Finch. And we went lots of places together and had a really good time. When the Boer War started though, he went to South Africa to fight and our relationship kind of cooled. Back to William, he had a plant in China. Um, the China plant was an egg production company and we had 900 employees there. And the best thing about that plant was that the Chinese didn't trust English money. They wanted paraffin, rice, or denim cloth for payment. And William was able to purchase that so inexpensively, so it was a very profitable plant. One of the problems was, if you've ever tried to ship an egg, they don't ship very well. And so England had really seasonal baking. They weren't able to um, have eggs all the time. So the owner or operator of our plant in China said, why don't we break these eggs, crack it, freeze it, and ship it that way. And it revolutionized baking in England, because now eggs were available all the time. William had started this refrigerated ship uh, in South America. He heard about a new process called freeze drying, and he went to South America to investigate. And so he built a cold storage facility in England and one in South America, and he built a ship, had a ship built that was um, refrigerated. And so he went to South America and he purchased partridges for his first experiment. And he froze them and he shipped them back and it was very successful. You know, in South America, it's a huge country and they have lots and lots of food and not very many people. So he was able to buy that produce and that food very inexpensively. And then he shipped it back to England where they really had a demand for it and he was able to make a profit there too. By the time William was 30 years old, he had enough money that he could have retired and never worked another day in his life. But of course, he would never do that. He was much too ambitious. He bragged once that when he was making 30,000 pounds a year, 
they lived on 500 pounds and he reinvested 29,500. I decided, um, I, by the early 1900s, I was the highest paid woman executive of that time. My salary had gone from $12 a week to $250,000 a year. But I was tired. I was tired of traveling and I just wanted to come back to my favorite place, Superior. And so between 1908 and 1912, I spent a lot of time in Superior. Mama uh, and I had purchased a house, but she wanted to live with Louis, my brother. And so where Papa's store was, um, we built a store on the bottom. We tore down the wood frame building and put up a brick building with the store on the bottom and living quarters on the top for Mama and my brother Louis and I. And we always loved fireplaces in England, but nobody in the United States knew how to build fireplaces. So we hired Mr. Amberson from Superior to come to England and learn how to build fireplaces. And then he came and built two fireplaces um, in our apartment. And in 1914, I finally retired from the company and moved back to Superior. They wanted me to run for mayor, but I didn't want to be mayor. But I joined the golf course, golf club, and um, I really helped with the hospital. Mama was very concerned about the hospital. Um, Superior just had a house um, that had a couple rooms in it. It wasn't much. Um, so she would go door to door and help um, get supplies for the hospital. And so I would help do that too. Uh, I bought a car. In those days, you could buy any color car you wanted, as long as you wanted black. And I never could tell my car when I'd come out of a store, and so I just bought red paint, painted my back tires red. And they thought it was a little eccentric, but it worked really well for me, and I could spot my car right away. So I did that. The car was really neat. It had doors in the middle that would open out this way, and then you'd come in and go around to the seat. So it was really kind of fun to have a car and drive around town. They also um, were expanding the park, and so I helped them get the money so that they could do a big park down in part of Superior. You know, one of the things I remembered when I came to Nebraska was there were no trees. When we got off the train, I was only three, but I remember it's just mile after mile of grass blowing in the wind and no trees anywhere. And I wanted the young people of Superior to always have a shady place. And so I helped them get the money for the park so that they would have a place for young people to go that was a little cooler. You know, Superior had one big tree at that time. And on Sundays, everybody would gather under that tree. It was just a fun place to go because it's always so much cooler if you can find shade. Um, then in 1914, World War I started. And William cabled me, and he said that they had gotten the contact, contract to feed all the Allied troops, and would I come back and help? Well, of course, I couldn't refuse to do that. So I went back to England. He said, we need you to go down to South America. And I went to South America, and I purchased a $20 million business down there. And we got it all set up and running. Um, then I went back to England, and he said, we really need you to go to Australia. Well, I couldn't go the normal way because the Germans were sinking ships. So I got on a ship and came to the United States. They had a train waiting for me. I took the train across the United States, got on another ship, and went to Australia. I was the only white woman on the group going into the interior of Australia. There were some other women, but not other white women. But I traveled to the interior of Australia, and I was able to negotiate the lease of millions of acres of land. And we already had processing plants at Sydney and Melbourne, and so um, we hired the people to run them, and we were able to get enough meat to feed the Allied troops. And at the end of World War I, William was made a member of the House of Lords and became Lord Vesty. So I finished things up, but by 1918, I was ready to retire again. So I moved back to Superior. Well, you know, in 1918 is when the Spanish influenza went through. And Superior realized that they had to have a hospital. By that time, they had a brick building on Main Street, but it only had, oh, I think it was less than 10 beds. So when I was home, they asked me to go door to door to raise, um, get supplies. And I said, well, what kind of supplies are we looking for? And they said, anything they'll give, food, blankets, pillows, whatever they give, bring it. And so I went to this house and I said, well, all we have is this old feather mattress. I said, okay. I didn't know what they'd do with that, but I put it on top of my car and drove it back and hauled it into the house. I told him, I said, ladies, look, I've got this old feather mattress. 
And they said, well, good, we'll use it to make new pillows. You'll use the feathers. And I said, well, I'll help you. And I grabbed some scissors and I split that mattress open and those feathers flew everywhere. It was like a snowstorm in this poor lady's house. Uh, I didn't realize that you have to cut a little hole and work the feathers through. After that, they didn't let me do that anymore. They would let me help keep books, but they wouldn't let me do the other things. In 1918, we had trouble with our plant in China, and William cabled me and said, we really need you to go to China. And I cabled back and said, no, I'm not going. Well, he came to Superior. And two days after he left, so did I, and I traveled to China. There was a revolution going on in China also, and it was very scary. We weren't sure we were going to get out of there alive. We had a ship waiting at all times so we could make a quick escape if we needed to. One of the things I'd done in my tour travels around the world, I'd traveled to every country in the world, spoke 17 different languages, not fluently, but enough to communicate for business purposes. But one of the things I'd done is pick up little trinkets and um, mementos of things that I thought would appeal to the young people of Superior, and I sent them back and they kept them at the library in the hopes that someday they would have a museum where they could display these things. I just wanted the young people of Spirit to know what was out there. I thought some of them might never have the opportunity to travel like I had. And I wanted them to be inspired that if I could do it, maybe they could do it. And so one of the things I found when I was in China was a cannon with Chinese writing on it. And so I bought it and I shipped it back and they put it in the park so that the young people of Superior would see what that looked like. Well, we got out of there safely, made it back to Superior, um, William Vesty was married. His wife's name was Sarah, and they had four sons. But at the birth of their last son, Sarah became kind of an invalid. She, was in, she had physical problems, but she also had mental problems and was unable to leave their home. So through the years when William would come to London on business, lots of times he'd bring his boys with him, and I would help him shop for school clothes. Sometimes William would come to our house. Mama lived with me off and on through the years, and she was a wonderful cook. So he loved to come to our house. Um, so we became really good friends. And I became really good friends with his children. Well, in 1923, Sarah died. And in 1924, I got a cable from William, and he said that Edmund was down at our South America plant, and he'd fallen and broken his leg. And would I please go down there and help finish up the business? Well, I couldn't refuse that. So I got on a ship and went down to South America, helped finish up the business and then got on a ship with Edmund and went back to England. And when we got off, there was William with his arms full of roses, and he asked me to marry him. And I said what any 49-year-old unmarried woman would say, I have to go home and ask Mama first. I never made any major decisions without Mama's approval. She was the smartest woman I ever knew. So I came back to Superior and I asked Mama what I should do. And she said, well, he is the richest man in England and the seventh richest man in the world. And if you marry him, you'll never have to worry about money. I said, but you know what? I have my own money. I was never one to spend a lot of money. I didn't really like shopping. I never made a purchase without serious consideration. Um, and so I had my own money. And she said, well, if you marry him, you might be the only small town uh, girl from Nebraska to ever become a member of English nobility. I said, well, I don't really care about that either. I'd never been one to seek um, notoriety or any recognition. And she said, well, I guess what really matters is, do you love him? And I said, I think I've loved him for a long time. And she said, then you should marry him. And so I cabled him and said yes, and he came to Superior. And we had a little gathering of our friends, about 40 friends, down at the Bon Ton Cafe. Uh, the name was much nicer than the actual cafe. But it was really fun, and we were going to get married on my birthday. It would have been my 49th birthday, August 1st. Um, but we decided to get married in New York City instead. And so we got married on August 9th. Um, before we left town, though, Mama was really worried about the apartment downtown because the steps were so steep, and she was afraid if there was a fire, she wouldn't be able to get out. And so William and I drove her around town, and we let her pick any house she wanted as a thank you for all the things she had done for me through the years. And she found a perfect house. She was so excited. And luckily, it was for sale. 
And so we were able to buy it. And uh, Mama came with us on the train as far as Chicago, but then she wasn't feeling well. So she turned around and came home. So she wasn't able to be at my wedding. But we got married at the little church around the corner. And we spent a week in New York City. And then we got on a ship to go back to England. And on the way, we got word that our plant down in Rio de Janeiro was on fire. And so as soon as we docked, business always came first. I was on the ship going to South America, and William went back to work in London. Um, when I was down there in South America, I got word from my brother Louis that Mama had, was busy packing. She was so excited, and um, she got uremic poisoning, and she died. And I was so far away when she needed me the most, and I just felt so helpless down there. And William came and got me, and we came back to Superior. And one of the things Mama had worked on all through the years was the hospital. And so my brother Louis and I got together and we said, let's, let's donate a hospital. And so we had our summer home on the middle of this lot. Um, it had belonged to Mr. Brown. And so the Three Sisters Oak Tree was out in the backyard. And um, we gave them that lot and we gave them the house, which they moved off of there. And they built a modern 25-bed hospital, one of the nicest hospitals outside of Lincoln or Omaha at that time. And one of my friends wrote to Willie Cather and said that Mama had died and would she write some kind of a message that they could put on a plaque in the hospital. And Willa, she was so unassuming, she just wrote back and said, well, how about this? She brought across the seas a high courage, a rich relish of life. It was perfect. And so they put that on a bronze plaque. And the hospital opened in 1928, and Willa Cather was here for the opening. Unfortunately, that's when we finally got to go on our honeymoon. So I wasn't here, but Willa was. William and I uh, lived in London. Um, we had a house. You'd come over the hill, and there's double gates. And you'd open the gate, and you'd go over the hill, and there was Kingswood, uh, four stories high. It was kind of a yellow brick house. The house had 45 rooms. I uh, had a garden uh, out in back which was well cared for with a, an archway that you could walk through with climbing roses over it and uh, a ballroom and marble floors. It was a very beautiful home. Um, it was very close to work which was the nicest place, the nicest thing about it because it was like being in the country but it was right in the middle of England, of London. And so we could easily get to work. Um, but it always rains a lot in England, and so we decided we wanted to travel. But William was one that never believed that you should pay somebody to do something you could do yourself. And so he had the Air and Door Star built, our own cruise ship. And uh, it was built to haul 400 people, and um, we traveled all around the Mediterranean Sea. It was so nice because you'd have your quarters and you could do a day trip and they'd plan it for you so you could like dock in Egypt and take a tour and then come back and all your things were there. We had a home down on the French Riviera um, and we spent a lot of time down there. William was 66 when we got married and so he was ready to slow down at work and so his brothers kind of took over the business so we were able to travel more and do more things together. We uh, got word in 1936 that my brother Lewis was sick. My brother Lewis was quite a character. He lived here in Superior, and he never got married. But he knew when every train would come into Superior. Superior had five trains a day, and he had his watch set so that it would go off. And he would be able to tell you who was coming, and who was going, and who was visiting, and what purchases they got, what packages they got. So his letters were always full of good information. Lewis liked to ride his bicycle, and so he belonged to the Century Club. So you'd ride 100 miles, and every time you did, you'd get a gold bar. And he wore a lo white long sleeve shirt, and there were gold bars all the way up his arm from his 100-mile bike rides. But what he actually did was start a magazine called the Philatelic West, and he traded coins and postcards and newspapers with people all around the world. They would, they would advertise in his book and then sell things to each other. Um, his handwriting was so poor that the publishers in Superior wouldn't publish it, so it had to be published outside of Superior. But he actually did more to put Superior on the map than I ever did um, with his Philatelic West. Eventually he sold it and it became the Hobbies magazine, which is still being produced. Louis did have a girlfriend, 
um, is Harry Hannah's sister. And the, um, she was an older lady too, kind of a spinster, and she and Lewis got along really well. So I was very excited for Lewis to have some companionship. And one day her mother was dying, and she was sitting at the foot of her mother's bed, and she just the daughter just fell over dead half an hour before the mother did. And so Lewis was never able to marry, and he was never able to have children, of course. So um, in 1936, he got sick, and we came back, and we took him to Mayo Clinic. But unfortunately, he also died. And so we wanted to do something for Lewis. And so we bought the land um, in the west part of Superior for a bird sanctuary. And they asked if they could put the football field there. And we said they could. And so it became the Broadstone Memorial Field in memory of my brother, Lewis. So William and I went back to England. Um, we worked some, we traveled a lot, but World War II was starting. And the United States, of course, didn't want to help because of World War I. They were tired of war, they didn't want to get involved. Um, the Battle of Britain started. And the Battle of Britain, German planes would fly over London day and night, dropping bombs, and you just never knew if your bomb was a direct hit, you were just gone. The air raid sirens would go off, and we'd have to go down to the basement, and it was damp, and we'd keep mattresses down there so we could try to get some sleep. The RAF, the Royal Air Force, did a really good job of trying to keep them out, but they still were managed to slip in. One day a man was driving down the road, and all of a sudden the car ahead of him just disappeared, got hit by a bomb. Um, when the air raid sirens would go off, if you're out in your car, you had to find a shelter or get out and lay in the ditch. Uh, it was really a rough time, and the fires were everywhere. And we knew Kingswood would be a target, and it was. Luckily, we'd moved out. They dropped a bomb in the backyard, and it blew out all the marble floors and all the windows and the doors and put glass everywhere. Um, it was so sad because we had used Kingswood for lots of volunteer things. We'd let young people come there. Um, they handed out gas masks from there. It was just sad for not just us, but for a lot of people to see Kingswood destroyed like that. The Arendor Star, they commandeered her and painted her battleship gray, and they used her to haul 1,700 men, uh, prisoners of war and internees, out of England to Canada for the duration of the war. And Captain Moulton, who was our friend, protested and said, you can't send us out without protection because the Germans are sinking ships and they didn't listen. And so they set sail and within a day they got hit by a torpedo. And of course all the lights went out. The men that were on the below decks found that they put barbed wire to keep them from moving from one deck to another. And a lot of them threw themselves on the barbed wire trying to break through and of course were caught there and sank with the ship. The ones that made it up on top found out that the life rafts were hooked down with a special um, lock and no one knew where the key was and they weren't able to get those open. They did have life jackets. There were some life boats and they were able to get those in the water but they'd taken out the oars to prevent somebody from escaping and so they had to paddle with their hands and there weren't enough life boats for everyone. The indoor star sank very quickly. Um, at the end, people were just jumping overboard. The captain was our friend, as well as William's nephew, who was an officer on board the ship. The rescue came fairly quickly, but the ones that were in the water were freezing cold, and a coat of oil had come to the surface when the Arendor Star sank, and so that to get them out of the water took hours. Um, over half of the men did, um, perished that day when the Arendor Star sank. It was one of our saddest losses. We lost a lot of ships in World War II, but that was the one that had the most meaning for us because we'd had so much fun on it. And it was just sad to see that many men leave, uh, die. Uh, an interesting story was that several years later, um, on one of the coasts, they found bodies washing ashore. And what they realized was that they were from the Arendor Star because with their life jackets, they stayed afloat. And so they started a cemetery for the men who had perished in the Arendor Star that showed up because they weren't able to identify who they were. 
So there's a cemetery there for them. So William and I um, did the best we could. You know, we lived on what we could. But in December 1940, William got sick and he died. So it's 1941 and I'm in England. My friends wanted me to come back to Superior when the war started, but I couldn't. I couldn't leave them. Uh, I felt like I had to be there to do my share. And so I'm living in a little house on the rail line. I have good friends, but now I've lost Mama and Papa, my brother Louis, and now William, the love of my life. I never got to have children because I was too old when I got married. Uh, William's children were nice to me, uh, but I didn't have children of my own. And in May of 1941, I got sick and I died. I was cremated and I wasn't able to have my ashes returned to Spirit until 1946 when I was returned to Spirit and buried at the foot of Mama's grave. Mama and Papa, my brother Louis and I are all buried together up in the Evergreen Cemetery which was actually um, on part of our original farm that we bought when we moved to Superior. We had deeded part of it to the city when Papa died so that um, he would be buried on our home place. Um, if you ever go to the cemetery, you'll see there's a, a block of marble and it's resting on a brick and it means she has fallen away in death. It was something that we had brought back from England. So I was buried in an alabaster urn at the foot of Mama's grave. My English estate, which was a lot, went to his brothers and his sons. But my American estate, which was worth about $250,000, I left to the hospital. Uh, and they still get income from that every year to help keep the hospital going. So I traveled many places and I saw many things. But I, I realized most was that there was no better place than Superior, Nebraska. And I was glad to be able to return home. Hi, Beverly. We are surrounded by Lady Vesti's gifts to the library that ended up in the Knuckles County Historical Museum. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we have here? Yes, if you come to the museum, you'll find some of my childhood things, the bed that I slept in, the doll that I played with in her carriage. You'll also find little trinkets and mementos I sent from around the world, from China and Japan. There is a rope made out of hair from Australia and a boomerang. When I was in Australia, they were trying to deliver a letter, which is just like a stick with writing on it, and they couldn't deliver it, so they let me have it, and so that's here. Uh, I collected spoons, and my spoon collection is here. The things from Lewis, the Philatelic West, and some of his coins and collections are here, as well as my diaries that have been preserved. Um, there were six diaries, and those are on display here as well. We also have um, a book full of different reading things about Lady Vesti, um, some newspaper clippings, and so if you need any more information, the Knuckles County Museum is the place to go. Great. Thanks. Beverly has passed the torch forward. This community has been blessed by her work, and we give her our deepest thanks.